Welcome. My name is Mike Denham, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to our first lecture of the 2022 year, which is part, of course, of our 2021-22 uh, Florida Lecture Series produced by the Lawton Child Center for Florida History. This uh, program tonight is sponsored uh, by the um, by the Lily Brown Law Firm, and I want to uh, recognize their support, and I'm very much delighted to, to have them as a sponsor tonight. Before we welcome our distinguished speaker, I'd like to say thank you for all of those of you that have contributed to our efforts this past year and in previous years. I really appreciate you coming out tonight, and you can be assured that we are doing our best to ensure that this gathering is a safe one. Um, and I'm just thinking, wow, what a, what a great group, given all of, the, all of the concern, of course, with the COVID situation. I really appreciate you coming out. Um, and I appreciate that everybody's abiding by our Florida Southern College indoor mask mandate. If you forgot yours, of course, we have extras, and we can provide you with an extra mask if you need one. And we can also provide you with some extra brochures outside uh, if you'd like to get one also. Uh, if you'd like to be in our mailing list, if you're here for the first time, please give me a card or you can sign up um, on the white legal pad outside um, near the books. Um, and basically, and, all, and while I'm talking about books, I wanna thank uh, J.B. Bauer, the manager of our bookstore, for once again making books available. And I wanna also thank Crystal Norman, and her Branscom staff for their professionalism and hospitality. Well, Chesterfield Smith, the subject of tonight's program, stood on this stage right here 21 years ago as Florida Southern College's honorary chancellor. We do that every year, and of course we've had many distinguished honorary chancellors over the years. And that night, or that, that day actually, Tom Brokaw, who featured Chesterfield in his book, The Greatest Generation, was also here, virtually, that is. And he was, of course, on the screen to personally congratulate Chesterfield uh, on that a special occasion. And I can tell you that it kind of woke the students up um, to see, the, to see the, um, uh, the screen come down um, and a person that they knew Tom Brokaw um, say, go Mox, and that was pretty cool. Never one to shun the limelight or dodge difficult moral questions, Smith was still a force to be reckoned with, even in his 80s, as he was in 1973 when he spearheaded the American Bar Association's condemnation of Richard Nixon during the Watergate scandal. Smith's damning statement, no man is above the law, turned him into a national figure. Yet Smith's outside accomplishments, outsized accomplishments, and equally outsized personality had already made the Florida attorney a legend in his home state. Child of the rural South, uh, coming from Arcadia, Florida, Smith earned a law degree and rose fast to lead the Florida bar and mastermind the drafting of the new state constitution in the late 1960s and early 70s. Meanwhile, he grew his small Florida or his small Bartow law firm into Holland and Knight, into Holland and Knight law firm, the legal leviathan he imbued with his own sense of public duty. Smith's idealism further mass, uh, manifested in his hiring of women and people of color, while his expansive professional network led to a close relation friendship with future Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Smith mentored several other outstanding legal figures and countless community service organizations are still influenced by his humane vision of the law. Chesterfield Smith was a defining Florida figure who became a legal giant. He was also a real character and I wish um, well, I know and I suspect tonight that there'll be many stories, and I have some of my own. I got to know him in his, final, in his later years, but I'm going to hold back and let 
other people, of course, do that. Now it's my pleasure to welcome tonight's special guest. Mary E. Adkins is Master Legal Skills Professor at the University of Florida's Frederick L. Levin College of Law. Professor Adkins has researched the history of the 1968 Florida Constitution and its revisions and has presented dozens of times on Florida constitutional history. And it was, it was that study that actually drew her to this topic. She's published two books, Making Modern Florida, How the Spirit of Reform Shaped a New Constitution. That came out in 2016. And of course, tonight's book, Chesterfield Smith, America's Lawyer in 2020, which won the 2020 Rembert Patrick Award presented by the Florida Historical Society for the best scholarly work on a topic of Florida history. Her co-authored casebook on Florida constitutional law will be published this year, and she's also published several articles on Florida constitutional history and constitution revision, and has served as an expert witness regarding the history of the Florida Constitution. She has conducted numerous oral history interviews of Florida legal, political, and historical figures, and is an executive board member of the Florida Supreme Court Historical Society. Prior to joining UF Law School, she worked in private practice, and she resides in the most beautiful community, one of the most beautiful communities in Florida, in my opinion, and that is Melrose, Florida, with her husband, Mitchell, who's with us tonight. Mitchell, can you be recognized? There you are, okay. Um, once again, welcome, and please welcome Mary Adkins to our stage. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Florida Southern College, and um, also the Lily Brown Law Firm for sponsoring me here tonight. Who was Chesterfield Smith? And why are you here tonight to hear about him? In fact, why did I spend all that time writing a book about him, and not just me, but my husband Mitchell Prue, my research partner, spent almost as much time as I did on Chesterfield Smith. If I said he was a lawyer, I don't think that that would pique anybody's interest, right? After all, even famous lawyers get famous sometimes for the wrong reasons. If I said he built a big law firm, that also doesn't really set him apart or make him special. If I said he fundamentally changed the way lawyers bill their clients, you might start getting irritated with me. So, I'm here tonight to tell you about an extraordinary man whose success surprised many people, who reached a pinnacle of pain, fame and power that many people would envy, and who turned that success not into a series of vacation homes, not into a privately built rocket ship, but into an attempt to make the world a better place through lawyers. He knew that lawyers have the training and the license and the knowledge to do what no other group of people can do, and that is to make the justice system and the laws of this country and state work for people. Because we have this privilege and others do not, Chesterfield Smith felt that lawyers are morally obligated to use their knowledge and their privilege to make the world around them a better place. And indeed, he took being a lawyer as kind of a sacred trust, and in this he was a picture of, of rectitude. Let's get to know him. Chesterfield Smith was raised in Arcadia, Florida, lonesome cattle country. His father had trouble keeping a job and left the family multiple times drinking, leaving his wife to support the three children on her meager income as a part-time newspaper columnist. Chesterfield, then known as Harvey, his middle name, was the oldest. He didn't have much motivation except to party and gamble, and he seemed to be destined to grow up to drive a candy truck, 
which is a job that he actually had off and on. His future wife, Vivian, with whom he grew up, would often say of him that he was just a poker-playing, crap-shooting boy who wouldn't settle down. He told a buddy in World War II that he didn't intend to finish college. After the war, he became known for his loud voice, his domineering personality, his terrible driving, and his awful table manner, sometimes eating salad with his hands and chocolate pudding with a knife. He made people uncomfortable with his blunt opinions, and he had a big ego. One wag said that Chesterfield Smith grew a very small one-man firm into a very large one-man firm, Holland and Knight. So that's one way to tell a story, and here's another. Chesterfield Smith was born into a prominent extended family in Arcadia, Florida. His uncles were generals, pharmacists, long-term legislators. His grandfather was a doctor. His father was a legislator and school superintendent. He worked his way through college, doing odd jobs, led a battalion in World War II, liberating a prison camp along the way. He married Vivian Parker, the smart, talented, refined daughter of Arcadia's largest cattle rancher. After the war, he excelled in law school and went on to a life of tireless activity. He built the law firm, Holland and Knight, had the long vision to pioneer specialization in law practice areas. He created a fund to repay clients who had been wronged or cheated by their lawyers, that fund paid for by lawyers. He spearheaded the creation of a new Florida constitution when one was needed. He led first his local bar association here in Lakeland, then the Florida Bar, then the American Bar Association. He called out Richard Nixon when the uh, evidence in Watergate had become overwhelming. He helped female lawyers and lawyers of color start to become a normal thing you see in law practice. He insisted on his lawyers and his firm doing free pro bono work, work for needed clients for no fee. He went around telling everyone to do good and be somebody, and much, much more. And of course, both versions of this story are true. So, so how do we figure out what made Chesterfield Smith special? Was it, was it the town he grew up in? Was it his childhood? Was it his family? Was it the war? Was it something else? So Smith was born into a segregated society, but as a lawyer, he was a pioneer in integrating at least his own firm, racially and with gender. Smith was born into a large and prominent extended family. It provided him a lot of support. But after his father lost his job as DeSoto County School Superintendent in 1928, he began being absent more and more, drinking. He rallied enough to serve a term as state legislature, as a state legislator, but he didn't get reelected. When the children were in their teens, he left his family forever. Smith's mother had to support the children. Smith's father, when he filed for divorce, lied and said that he didn't know where his wife was living so that he could publish the announcement of the uh, impending divorce in the Key West newspaper. Smith's little brother Gilbert, who participated in D-Day, applied for hardship leave to go home to help his mother when he found out that dad was gone for good, but unfortunately that leave was denied. So Chesterfield Smith was an aimless teenager. He partied and caddied and gambled. He worked odd jobs, but he also graduated near the top of his high school class. And at age 16, he went with his father to Tallahassee for the legislative session where he acted as a page. He was 23 and only about halfway through college when he enlisted with the Florida National Guard 
field artillery. It was 1940. War was in the air, although Pearl Harbor wouldn't be attacked for another, more than another year. Smith would spend five years in the military, some of it fighting in the European theater of operations. He would be 30 before he graduated law school. And by then, he was a different man. He was becoming the Chesterfield Smith that the state and the nation would come to know, the one who wouldn't tolerate inequality, the one who told law students that if they didn't want to do pro bono work, he hoped they would flunk the bar. The one who took a four-person law firm in Bartow and turned it into Holland and Knight, a 1,600-person law firm with offices in several countries in many states. Smith also was the one who called out Richard Nixon after what became known during Watergate as the Saturday Night Massacre. Chesterfield Smith famously declared, no man is above the law. Now, in the meantime, back in Florida, Holland and Knight was growing and spreading to several cities. After he came back from his ABA presidency, Smith made sure that women lawyers and lawyers of color were hired in the firm. First among them was Martha Barnett, who went on to great fame as a female lawyer. Not only did the firm hire these lawyers, but after a few awkward fits and starts, it also promoted and nurtured, and nurtured them. It was often Chesterfield himself who would take these non-traditional lawyers under his wing to support them. And though the firm was always profitable under Smith's urging, he insisted that they form a community services team consisting of a partner and a couple of associates, all of whom were paid the same as profit-making lawyers. Now this cut into the partner's pay, but Smith really didn't care. He uh, told them if they wanted to make the highest possible profits, they should leave the firm and go to another firm. He said, it's okay, we'll still be friends, but if your priorities are different than mine, we should part ways. So, he knew that helping, that both the optics and the reality of helping needy people with their legal um, problems was more important than putting a few extra dollars in an already well-paid partner's pocket. So, I have to ask again, who was Chesterfield? And in fact, what was Chesterfield? And how did he go from being Harvey, the poker playing crap shooting boy who wouldn't settle down to being Chesterfield Smith, the living moral compass? Well, he didn't talk about it, even if you asked him. People who knew him suspected that something happened with him during the war that changed his attitude. But they also had to admit that he didn't talk about the war and he really didn't talk about his childhood either. So after a lot of searching of a lot of documents and interviewing a lot of people, we've been able to tease out a few ideas that what, about what may have made him special. So number one, coming from Arcadia, a frontier town. Many of you know Arcadia, and it hasn't changed dramatically since 1917 when Chesterfield Smith was born. The nearest place to watch a picture show back then was in Fort Myers, a 100-mile round trip away on those roads with those cars. If kids wanted to entertain themselves, they could catch and sell rattlesnakes or go to the rodeo. So one of the activities in the rodeo involved a Coke bottle just like this one. This was bottled in Arcadia many decades ago. So picture this, teams of two cowmen would dash over to one of several cows who were not used to being milked, and one of them would hold the cow still while the other one tried to fill up this Coke bottle with her milk. And the first team to get back with the full bottle alive won. So that was entertainment, but Chesterfield's family were not ranchers. So there really wasn't a lot of obvious opportunities for a kid like Chesterfield Smith 
in a small town, but he must have realized that if he didn't buck up, he wasn't going to have a future. And if he didn't buck up, he might not even get his girl. Number two, coming from the family he came from. On one hand, he had his illustrious uncles, the generals, two generals, the pharmacist, the long-term legislator named Chesterfield Smith as well, his grandfather, Chesterfield Smith, the doctor, all on one side. On the other side, he sees in his own nuclear family, he sees struggle and he sees what looks like irresponsible behavior from his father. So the contrast had to have been stark. Now, if you would think that Chesterfield having a father with a drinking problem would make him into a teetotaler, you would be mistaken. Number three, fighting the Nazis. Chesterfield Smith in the European uh, theater of World War II would have seen the devastation that sheer prejudice can do when taken to its extreme. But also, in World War II, number four, he proved himself to be a leader, and in fact, he himself said that it was in the army that he realized that he was a leader and could lead people. And it does appear that at some time during the war, Smith's uh, viewpoint and attitudes did begin to change. He began to look at the world differently. One episode that occurred when the war was winding down may be telling. And that is, as captain of a field artillery battalion, he was in charge of keeping order in a German town. And on his way in, on his group's way into the town, they had passed a prison camp on the outskirts of town. And the conditions were just horrific. The people were emaciated, they looked awful, there was vermin. It was, it was an, a horrendous situation. So Smith found the burgomeister of the town and he said, I tell you what, the people in that prison camp are going to live in the houses of the citizens of your town. And the citizens of your town are going to go live in the prison camp until they get it cleaned up so that human beings can live in it. And that took two days. But he never bragged about this. In fact, his own children didn't know about it for 50 years. On the 50th anniversary of the end of the war, the medic, or a medic in his battalion wrote a history of, of that group, and that's the first time um, any of the family have found out about this, uh, this situation. So even in a situation like this, Smith kept his sense of humor during the war. He, in retrospect, um, talked about the fine oysters that he enjoyed during a siege near Cherbourg, France. Another example of Smith's humor <laughs> is that, as the medic wrote, he, he bitterly exclaimed toward the end of the war that he had commanded the highest battery in the highest battalion, in the highest division, in the highest arm of the war in the European theater of operations as measured by its rate of venereal disease. <laughs> Yet, this boy from Arcadia seems to have come away from the war with an appreciation for institutions and the good or the bad that they can do, and also a realization, again, of the devastation that prejudice can cause. But even the leadership and the moral clarity that he seems to have developed during the war didn't really seem to have borne fruit immediately. Uh, Mitchell and I researched thoroughly and hard looking for when was the first time that we were able to see evidence of Chesterfield Smith sort of becoming a person that, that turns the world around, that turns it for his vision of good. And we really couldn't find anything for the first decade or so of his practice. Um, 
During these years, roughly from the early 50s to the early 60s, he seems to have just been working hard at his firm, getting established. Um, during this period was when he began to work for the Bartow firm, Holland, Beavis, McRae, and eventually Smith. It didn't take very long for that Smith to be added, though. So the first partner, Holland, was Spessard Holland, who I'm sure is a familiar name to all of you. He had been governor and was then a US senator. His name stayed on the firm, but he was not directly involved in any of the profits or any of the client work of the firm. Um, but he uh, intended to come back eventually when he was done with politics. The senior partner who was the most active during Smith's time was a man named William McRae, Bill McRae. He was a Rhodes Scholar. He was a former UF law professor. He was a former All-American football player from the University of Florida. And he was an adjutant to General Hap Arnold, if any of you know who that is. He would often correct Smith's briefs using Greek or Latin phrases. But Smith loved him. And his son Chet told me that he thought that Bill McRae was the only person his father ever truly revered. The two of them, Smith and McRae, would spend Saturday mornings sitting in the Smith's backyard, sending Chet, who couldn't have been more than 10 at the time, off to shuck oysters for them while the two men shared a bottle of scotch and planned for what wasn't known at the time, which was how do we get our firm to grow big? Firms growing big didn't happen uh, back in the 50s, but they were planning it. They were plotting it even then. So in his first decade or so of practicing law, he doesn't seem to have tried to do any of these large gestures. And to quote an obscure line from the, from the musical Hamilton, they practiced law, practically perfected it, but they don't seem to have done much else. He didn't yet have a name uh, for going around doing good, but he was beginning to be somebody. So it does seem that his first um, attempts at sort of trying to do good on a bigger stage, began with his Florida bar presidency in 1964 and 65. That was when he tried uh, two, two big um, impetuses, I guess I should call them. One was to create this thing called a client security fund. He wanted every lawyer to have to pay about a dollar a year to make a pot of money so that the very few very small percentage of clients who had been cheated or wronged by their lawyers would have a fund, a lawyer-funded fund, to reimburse them. The other thing he tried to do was reform the judicial system. And I see um, Justice Lewis in the audience, um, a, a shining example of our, of our reformed judicial system. But Chesterfield Smith didn't get it reformed during his year of the presidency, so he was reaching but he wasn't able to grasp yet. So the following year, 1966, Chesterfield was asked by the governor at that time, Hayden Burns, to please chair a Constitution Revision Commission. The Constitution of the time was from, uh, from 1885, and it contained things in it like, colored children and white children shall never go to the same school together. And, uh, Lots of other things along those lines. It also had, well, our current constitution has, has, has also become a little bit weird, hasn't it? But back then, the old one had things like, the legislators shall be reimbursed 10 cents per mile for driving back and forth to Tallahassee. This was in the constitution. So Chesterfield Smith chaired this group of people to write and, 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 um, and update and revise completely the old constitution. Many people call him the father of our constitution for that reason. And in that, he was again reaching. He tried to get a provision for equal rights for women in there, but he didn't make it. That wouldn't happen for about 30 more years. So at the same time, 
almost exactly the same time that the Constitution, the new Constitution was being adopted, Smith merged his law firm, again, Holland, Beavis, McRae, and Smith, which they had already added a lot of people, and one of the early hires was Mr. Park Hill Mays, who was going to be able to make it tonight, um, but he, at the last minute, wasn't able to. Um, he merged it with a Tampa law firm called Knight, Germany, and Jones. And even though by then Chesterfield Smith was the undisputed star of his firm and really of all Florida lawyers, he insisted that his name not be in the new firm name at all. Instead, it was named for Holland, Spessard Holland, who we've talked about, and Peter O. Knight from the Knight firm. Smith knew that if the firm name was going to be named for the active senior partners, that the name would be changing all the time, and the name recognition would suffer. And in his, um, his dream to have a huge law firm with offices everywhere, he didn't want there to be a problem with name recognition, so he wanted to go with the founding two names of the firm, and as a result, Holland and Knight hasn't changed its name in more than 50 years. And there's a story that Senator Holland actually begged Smith to put his own name in the firm, and here's how that story goes. Smith is the head of the firm. He's insisting that it be named Holland and Knight. Smith, not Smith and anybody, but Holland and Knight. Another effect that had was that none of the other partners dared say that their name should be in it, right? if the star wasn't putting his name in it. So Holland says, look, I'm gonna retire. I wanna come back and practice law in Chesterfield. I don't wanna practice law in a firm that doesn't have your name in it. And the story goes that Chesterfield said, well, Senator, what firm do you plan to work for? So he got his way as he so often did Smith's next adventure was getting elected president of the American Bar Association in 1973. As with many organizations, he got elected to president-elect a year before so that he had a year to plan. He had all these priorities. He had, he had initiatives. He had all kinds of plans for his great ABA presidency. The ABA is the largest and most powerful voluntary uh, group of lawyers or association of lawyers in the country. It uh, is uh, best known for having the power to accredit or deaccredit all law schools in the country and also makes uh, recommendations for federal judicial appointments. But one thing it had never done before Chesterfield Smith was it had never gotten involved in politics. Well, Smith's presidency happened to coincide with the Watergate scandal. And in fact, after a particular beginning point, it got completely hijacked by Watergate things. So the turning point came on a Sunday afternoon in October 1973. Chesterfield Smith and his assistant, Bill McBride, Forgive me, I gotta have some water here. And his assistant, Bill McBride, were at a Chicago Bears game. The ABA is headquartered in Chicago and Smith and his wife had moved there for the presidential year. Chesterfield couldn't concentrate on the game. He said it was a lousy game, but he couldn't concentrate because the news had just broken that President Nixon had, well, I'll put it this way, what has since become known as the Saturday Night Massacre had occurred. President Nixon had fired Archibald Cox, the independent prosecutor, who, the special prosecutor whom he had appointed for, uh, for subpoenaing tapes that looked like they probably had to do with the, water, the Watergate cover-up. And it triggered a string of resignations, uh, if you remember, those of you who do. Maybe you read it in a history book. 
But anyway, um, Nixon had been subpoenaed to have these, to produce these tapes. Smith knew that as a lawyer, what you're supposed to do is either produce them or object. And he knew that Nixon knew this because Nixon was a lawyer. But Nixon hadn't done the two things he could do. He hadn't produced them and he hadn't objected. Instead, he fired the person who required them. Well, that's not following the rule of law. And that's what offended Chesterfield as a lawyer. It wasn't that he disagreed with Nixon's politics or policies. It was that Nixon knew what he was supposed to do and he refused to do it. That's what made Chesterfield say, no, Mr. President, you are not above the law. It isn't that you have to produce them, it's that you have to follow the rules. Well, Chesterfield leaves the game, goes back to ABA headquarters, calls a bunch of other ABA leaders, talks it over, and goes on national TV that night with this speech and this famous comment, no man is above the law. Well, that caused a firestorm, as you can imagine. Many people started calling for the resignation of Chesterfield Smith. After that point, some people from the ABA said, every time Chesterfield Smith gave a speech, 100 people would quit the ABA and 1,000 new people would sign up. So he did become a, a very hot property on the lecture circuit. He was the first real member of the establishment to so boldly speak up about what was wrong with what Nixon was doing. Chesterfield became a, a temporary superstar. Um, one night, he comes home late to his Chicago apartment and finds Barbara Walters standing there waiting to interview him. His family got death threats. About the same time, his son, back in Lakeland, Florida, got arrested for streaking with the teenage daughter of one of Chesterfield's partners. And this actually resulted in uh, another few letters to Chesterfield Smith that said things along the lines of, this is the quality of person that's condemning Nixon. So it didn't help. And a, a cute anecdote about that is that, of course, Chesterfield Smith gets interviewed about this because his son's name was Chesterfield Smith Jr. So it becomes international news. He got a letter from Ted Kennedy, who had been in Paris at the time and read about it in the International Herald Tribune. Um, so Chesterfield gets interviewed and they say, well, you know, what do you, do you think your son needs a lawyer? And Chesterfield said, he doesn't need a lawyer, he's guilty. So, so these were turbulent times. Chesterfield Smith also happened to make it not only into the TV screens of Americans and on the newspaper uh, front pages, but he also made it into Nixon's daily press briefing, which I found out when I did some research on this subject in the um, Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California. And I'm very proud of this um, credential. You can see it's lived a long time in my wallet. Um, for about 10 days, Chesterfield Smith called usually something like ABA Brexy, P-R-E-X-Y Smith, said this or said that. Anyway, so it was his kind of, you know, famous time. So Chesterfield Smith ends up giving speeches for nearly a year, not on the initiatives he wanted, but on Watergate, because that's what people wanted to hear him talk about. And he did use this ABA bully pulpit to maximum advantage, including in his farewell address as president. It was held in Honolulu. In Pearl Harbor, he gives his farewell address, and on this stage, lined up behind him, are admirals standing proud 
and Chesterfield Smith, a World War II veteran, a decorated veteran, chooses this moment to advocate for amnesty for Vietnam draft dodgers. And while he was at it, he advocated for the decriminalization of marijuana. So he wasn't shy, and he wasn't afraid to go out with a bang. So when he got back to his home, there we are. When he got back to his home, he starts concentrating on building Holland Knight a little bit better. And as I said before, he's hiring women. He's hiring blacks. Remember, the law was, was and really still is dominated by, by white guys, right? It, it was ex nearly exclusive then. So Chesterfield wanted to even things up. And he hired these people, he nurtured these people. He decided then finally that having offices in eight places in Florida did no good unless he had one in Miami. So he and his wife Vivian pull up their roots in Bartow, sell their house, and move to Coral Gables to make sure that the new Miami office is going to succeed. He populated that office with lawyers of every color, every stripe and creed. He didn't even shrink away. This was the 80s. He didn't shrink away from having an out gay lawyer during the AIDS scare. And when his other partners came to him and said, oh, what are you going to do about this guy? He's in the newspapers. Everybody knows he's gay. And Chesterfield said, does he do good work? Does he have a good work ethic? OK, then I don't want to hear anything more about it. So he was, you know, he was a, a bit of a hero to people who weren't traditional. And again, this was about the time that he prodded his firm to start that community services team. And he also began being known at this time more than before. He started going around telling everybody to do good. And by this, he didn't mean do well. He didn't mean get rich, necessarily. He meant do good around you. And also, be somebody. Be somebody that people in your community will know and look up to. And it gives you a platform to do more good. By the end of his life, he had so many friends and mentees that, as Martha Barnett said one time, she said, I bet you there's a hundred people who believe that Chesterfield Smith gets up in the morning and while he's shaving, he's saying, what can I do for Mary, Mary's career this morning? What can I do for Martha? What can I do for Jim or Mike or Bill? He had that kind of effect on people. And he didn't really turn it off. When she visited him for the last time, it turned out that she would never see him again. He was in the hospital. His last words to her were, do good. So perhaps it's not surprising that his life had what Alex Sink, another friend of his, called the multiplier effect. And what she meant by that was that she and lots of other people whom he knew would, would remember these things. They would go out and they would do good. They would tell other people to do good. And many followed in his footsteps. And one great uh, set of examples I can give you is that after Chesterfield Smith, a University of Florida law grad, yay, was ABA president. Three other University of Florida law grads, only one of whom was in his firm, later became ABA presidents. In fact, those four, along with the one who preceded Chesterfield, I know at one time UF had more ABA presidents than any other law school, including the ones you might think about. So this is no accident. After Smith had gotten out of the ABA, he had a friend, a young protege, who was with a different firm. And this guy's name was Sandy D'Alembert. Now, many of you may know his name. He eventually was um, the dean of FSU Law School and then the president of FSU. Um, he did a lot of good everywhere. But he never would join Holland and Knight because of that profit, that profit level problem. So 
One day Chesterfield said, Sandy, you really need to get involved in the ABA. I think you can be president. And Sandy said, I'm not interested. And Chesterfield said, well, that's too bad because I've um, created a new committee and I've put you on it. And Sandy went ahead with it. And before very many years had gone by, he was president of the ABA. A few years after that, Chesterfield looked at his favorite protege, Martha Barnett, from Lacucci, and he said, you know, Martha, you need to be the first female ABA president. And uh, I don't see any record that she actually tried to talk him out of it, but he got her on the right committees, got her introduced to some people, and sure enough, she became the first female ABA president. A few years after that, Steve Zack. Steve Zack had been the youngest Florida Bar president uh, in history up to that time. He said, Steve, you need to be president of the ABA. And Steve said, Chesterfield, I'm sorry, but you're crazy. I'm not really very involved. So you know the story. A few years later, he was ABA president, the first Cuban ABA president in its history. So Chesterfield not only advanced himself and not only advanced the causes of poor people and common people, but he really worked hard to bring up everyone around him and to make their lives be all it could be. So, I'm gonna ask you again, who was Chesterfield Smith? And what can we learn from him? So here are a few ideas. Call out wrong when you see it, don't be shy. Number two, do good. Make your world better. Number three, don't be afraid to be somebody in your world so that you can do even more good. Number four, help the people that you believe in. Number five, be energetic. He wasn't known for saying that, but he was certainly known for never running out of energy. Number six, it's okay to take a while to decide what you want to do. At 23, he, he left college for five years. He was 30 before he became a lawyer. Number seven, enjoy life, every bit of it. Chesterfield's wonderful life, wife, Vivian, died of cancer when they were in their 60s, and he mourned her. But it didn't take very long at all before he decided I need to get married again, and I want to do it before I'm 70. So at nearly 70, he got remarried to a woman 25 years younger. So live life, all of it. Don't be afraid just because time is passing. But there are a few more lessons from Chesterfield, and these are kind of the reverse lessons. And these are things that he didn't do. And his coworkers and his mentees noticed these things, and in fact, everything that I'm about to mention came from someone who knew him, worked with him, and loved him. Number one, pay attention to your family. Chesterfield's wife, Vivian, had to explain to their children why dad is never at my ball games, why dad doesn't come to my recitals, and that couldn't have been easy. Number two, know when to turn it off. He was asking about problems with the firm on his deathbed. Number three, take care of your health. Even though he lived to nearly 86, and this cardboard cutout was from his 80th birthday party, even though he lived to nearly 86, he had several health problems for several years before he died. And as his buddy Alex Sink once told me, you could take one look at him and know that he never exercised a day in his life. So take care of yourself. And so to put it differently, here's a last few things that we can learn from Chesterfield. We can be this Chesterfield sometimes with our family. We can be this Chesterfield sometimes in our professional life. But we can also be this Chesterfield sometimes. And I think Chesterfield would want us to live life 
as much as we can because it is short and it is precious. And I thank you. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate that. That was great. Um, before we turn it over to some questions, I know there's some people that have some questions and maybe a story or two. I want to recognize again Justice Lewis and also um, Judge E.J. Salcinas, who is with us from Tampa, who came over and, of course, was a, a great associate of Chesterfield's as well. So, um, welcome. And, and I didn't see you up at the stage, but now I do see you. So, um, do we have anybody that would like to say something or ask a question? Remember, Chesterfield, do it, right? Don't, don't be bashful. Stories would be welcome. I left out hundreds. I'm going to need a microphone. I'm sorry. Okay. Let, yeah. um, let, me, let, me, let me see if I can relay the question here. A little bit better. Oh, his, his eulogy. Do you know who his, did his yes, eulogy? Yes, it was Dennis Archer, the first black ABA president. Yes. Okay. Good question. Thank you. Okay. And I believe also he was a mayor of Detroit at, at one point, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell a Chesterfield story that has to do with my husband. Um, I, I started my career at Holland and Knight, but I was not one of his famous mentees. I was just a new associate in um, the Jacksonville office, and I didn't know anyone. And we went to a firm lawyer's retreat one summer. They had them every summer. And um, we're standing in the line to check into the hotel, and we see that in the next check-in line is famous Chesterfield Smith, and he was standing with my own senior partner, so, I, you know, I didn't feel completely um, intimidated, so Mitchell and I turn and, and say hello to them, and you, you, you're probably too dignified to actually demonstrate what he did. <laughs> so Chesterfield, you know, we're both saying, oh, Mr. Smith, it's so nice to meet you. Thank you. You're such a wonderful person. You've grown this firm, blah, 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 blah. And Chesterfield Smith, I'm just going to do it to myself, turns to my husband and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't know what that meant. Still don't know. Still don't know. He did become great friends with Ruth Bader Ginsburg back when she was Professor Ginsburg. They were both... Um, they were both active in the ABA, and they went on an ABA trip to China in the late 70s, which is how they became friends. So, you know, although Justice Ginsburg did get famous one time for saying that she fell asleep during a State of the Union address because she might not have been 100% sober, I don't know if y'all remember that, but she was very shy and retiring and very much off to herself, and of course Chesterfield Smith was this big exuberant guy, um, but somehow they became friends during this trip and just thought the world of each other. And just after she was um, sworn in as a Supreme Court justice. He was at their Washington office with another lawyer, um, and they're standing on a street corner waiting for a cab, and this car drives up, and the window goes down, and here's little bitty Ruth Bader Ginsburg going, Chesterfield, Chesterfield, you want a ride? So, you know, completely, uh, you know, awe-striking the uh, other partner. So, yeah, any Y'all have to come up with some questions or stories or something. He put his feet up on the table and he had a huge hole in his sock. <laughs> and he didn't care. <laughs> I don't know, that's, that's my biggest he, memory of he him, didn't which is care. ridiculous. Was that at the house in Bartow? Yes. 
That's wonderful. Are you as, were you associated with the firm, or was it just a? My husband was, I think, the thirteenth lawyer that came to Holland. Beva Smith, Kibler, and Hall. Yes, and at that the point. and what was his name? John Purcell. Okay. That okay. Yeah, there were there are some real stories about the parties at their house. But Chesterfield was, he was very down to earth. He was, you know, the straight talking, down to earth, cracker talking guy. And his wife was. Um, a concert pianist, uh, very refined. Um, you know, there was art, art on the walls of her home. And what I'm told by their daughter is that on the dining room wall in their house, when the kids were growing up, they had a, um, a big sign on the wall with table manners in fine calligraphy. And all I can think is that maybe it rubbed off on the children Well, Mary, thank you so much for that, for that presentation. We have some books out here if people would like to get one, and I'm sure you'd like to sign one for them too. And I just want to remind everybody that uh, next month, February 10th, we'll be hosting Janice Owens, uh, who is a very, very uh, well-renowned well author who's actually a fiction writer. And many of you who know me know that I don't read fiction. Uh, but I've actually read her fiction, and, I, and it's wonderful. She's actually a kind of a protege of Pat Conroy. Many of you might know Pat Conroy's writing and so forth. So anyway, looking forward to, uh, to having her and uh, seeing you back here again February 10th. So thank you very much for being with us tonight.